This is the third in uh, the series of uh, interview guidance, all in all, personality test for civil services. So first one centered around uh, why is it that interview is significant? Uh, the second was uh, one was uh, going to be on uh, the type of qualities that a student must go to possess in order to appear for the interview. The third is about a guideline. That is, what are the types of interviews uh, and uh, what are the type of guidelines that can be given to a candidate in order to in order to score well in the interview. The interview is uh, actually a subjective assessment of uh, the candidate. The things that aspirants must go on to keep in mind is that it totally depends upon the board members to have an assessment of. This assessment is done through a different combination of questions which determine different types of interview. One of these interviews is called a structured, another is unstructured, the third is lead interview, the fourth is going to be stress interview. These are the four broadly broad types of interviews here that a candidate is likely to face. A structured interview is one when all questions are prepared in advance, where there is a systematic movement of the questions from one section to another section. For example, a structured interview for civil services will go on to comprise of asking questions from DAC, that is, detailed application form, then about uh, the subject, then that will go on to be about current affairs, then there will be some of these applied questions. Uh, so four aspects picked up and the interview will be over. This is in contrast, a structured interview is in contrast with a uh, an unstructured interview in which there are no specific set of predetermined questions and the interviewer is able to change the questions at any time and ask follow-up questions to the interview's response. The aim of this approach is to ensure that each interview is presented with by and large similar pattern of questions and roughly in the same order. Unstructured will be beginning with not only DAF. It can begin from anywhere. It can go to begin from a current affairs. It can go to begin from your village. It can begin from uh, the personality of the Prime Minister. It can go to begin from uh, whatever uh, the US President Mr. Donald Trump is talking about. It can go on to go through any and it can go on to be factual. It can go on to be analytical and maybe after something like some 20 factual questions, one of them can go on to be analytical to such an extent uh, and to such a large extent uh, that uh, the whole of the interview will go on to get over with it. So the interview can go on to begin uh, in this case uh, with uh, in a structured or a structured interview with uh, the meaning of your name, the relevance of a birth date for you, the significance of the place where you're born, why you have been chosen, one uh, a specific set of subjects, why is it your preference for IS first, uh, how do you go on to pursue your habits, hobbies, etc. Structured. Structured interviews are mostly based on DEF analysis, DAF analysis, which the candidates can always prepare. Structured interviews questions can be open-ended or close-ended. Close-ended questions ask candidates to, to, to a specific, for a specific places pieces of information and often require the respondent to choose from a, a list of given alternatives. A closed question might be something like a Bihar is backward. Do you agree? It do you agree by it or not? The answer can be yes or no. The interviewer uh, interviewer does not have a room for any any elaboration. Now maybe that the person who is taking the interview wants to see whether the conclusion of the candidate goes into match the observation of a, the interview in this case or not. That is close ended. Open-ended questions are those that can be answered in many ways and allow the respondent to give up elaborated, thoughtful answers. An open-ended question might be, do you think that the reservation policy has done anything good for the country? The respondent could choose anything in favor and against and is not limited to few responses in this case. Even with respect to, let's say, Bihar, why Bihar is backward? Maybe that you are asked about that Bihar is backward because of the psych of the people. Do you agree by that? Now that goes on to make it uh, open-ended for you. And you shouldn't go on to feel bad that Bihar is backward. The second is lead interview. 
This interview is based on the answers and the lead given by the candidates eh, who can use their answer to guide the interviewer towards a question that the candidate himself or herself wants to be asked. That is, eh, if I am giving the interview, I am going to determine what type of questions can be asked to me and I am going to lead the board in such a manner. For example, in response to a question on himself, eh, the candidate can answer a question that he behaves in wisdom, he, he believes in wisdom more than he believes in knowledge. Now, that will going to leave the scope and curiosity for the interviewer to ask question on the differentiation between knowledge and wisdom. Then, the candidate uses the term local and global wisdom. Then, the uh, interviewer goes on to ask differentiating both of them. Then, he talks about emotional differentiation. He, then, he talks about a uh, wisdom uh, as part something that is going to be uh, can be obtained, something that is going to be innate. Then the third part is going to be stress interview. A stress interview is to evaluate the stability of the psyche of the candidates. Questions are put up in such a stressed manner in order to evaluate the thinking of the candidate. Since in a career many stressful events take place, so it is highly suitable to judge student in this regard. Normally, this type of interview is done on those candidates where there is a slight doubt whether the candidate can withstand such a load or stress or not. Or if the candidate is very good, then the interviewer wants to reinforce his viewpoint that the candidate is very good and can withstand any amount of stress. So it can go to be something like one of the members is asking a rapid fire, another is asking an ethical question. So the candidate has to be very, very alert. And if a candidate has been subjected to a stress interview, it is a testimony to the talent in the candidate that the board wants to put them in the stress to see how much amount of stress that one can go to bear. In this case, a stress interview is performed not on, not on ordinary candidates. It is only something like a someone who has attempted the exemption three times, one who is already in the service as a, or one who whose bio data and whose data is a superb, is excellent. It's going to be out of the world. So it is only in this condition that that can happen. This is, these are the type of interviews. A stress interview is a one also which is a going to be such type of interview where the board will go on to put the students in a complete corner and see whether the candidate is able to get out of this corner or not. That is a, maybe that in term type of debate, something on a, something on a, the Pakistan policy of India. The board will go on to put the candidate in a fix and to see whether the candidate is able to emerge out of it in a balanced and rational manner or not. No interview is good that way. Structure is not good, but of course that is a good in the sense that is easy and it's because it's easy that the students don't go to get too many marks. And the structure is no one knows what exactly goes on to transpire to the mood of it. Lead interview that can be very good because uh, maybe because the candidate once that the board should go to ask some type of question to them and the board actually goes into ask this question so that can go to be actually good a stress interview if the candidate is able to face it it can be i just going to give an example that is a one of these candidates that we went on to interview he had some type of interest in a tourism and he had written traveling as well so we went on to begin by asking what exactly is the difference between tourism and traveling he was not able to sustain his uh, answer, but ultimately we went on to make it clear that a traveler is one for whom there is no destination, a tourist one there is a destination. So he nodded his head. Thereafter we came to travelers, I mean who are the best known travelers that the world has known and what exactly is it that the mental setup that is required to be a traveler. He was not able to answer one of these questions. He did took some examples and some names of the travelers from, from outside India, but no one from India. Of incidentally, it had been Rahul Sankrityan from India who had been one of these tra travelers. And then, then we went on to move on what type of a mindset that one is required in this case. Then, uh, and it was in this case, he said that if one can go to move to any destination. So we asked him whether he has moved to any destination in this case or not. So he talked about Ladakh. Now, when he talked about Ladakh, then uh, the question centered around that is uh, which was the route that he took uh, from Leh to go to Pangong So, 
and how is it that he went on to make it sure that if he was going to to Nubra Valley, to the Shok River Valley, and also to some of these places like Diskete, and what may have happened to the fate of Diskete. What exactly was something that was written on the boards on this kit where most of these nomads used to write uh, the relevant information. It was this relevant information that was shared by all of those nomads uh, and uh, this had been incidentally one of uh, this methodology and one of these methods uh, also known for uh, known by Facebook people who took a lot of ideas from uh, the from uh, the lifestyle of the nomads. Uh. Now, that was a stress. We went on to kept on asking, kept on asking. He was ultimately split apart. He was completely in uh, sh in, in shambles after that. So we did said that he said we advised him that is when you go on to write some of these things, you must go on to make it sure that you are able to answer any question that can possibly be framed out of it. So that was the first part of the discussion. The second part of discussion centered around a guidelines for interview. To be successful interview or any type and for any kind of position one may have to follow certain type of guidelines and uh, someone has to follow certain type of advisories in this case here. The first is that means this is something that the candidates must follow. First is frame your attitude right before you create first impression. Interview is a test of your attitude, a test of your personality and test of how you think why you think a test of where you use your heart, where you use your mind and a test of where you have to think of your country, where you have to think of yourself, etc. Interview is all about being in equilibrium with a state of mind, heart, perception and reality. The interview or the student must realize certain aspects before they think of making their first impression. That is, they have to tune themselves. And of course, they are able to tune themselves only when they have a very good self-understanding about themselves. They are very confident about themselves and they know what they are. The interview board members are God's first. The, the first thing that the, uh, that the candidates must realize is that the interview board on that day are gods for this one. They are all gods in one. Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh, Allah, Christ, Guru Nanak and what not. There is no one more important on that day other than the board members. The second aspect that the students have to know is that these students are at the mercy of the board and at the whims of the board. If the board wishes to exercise these aspects and if they're going to wish to exercise their whims and mercies. The third is, the purpose of the board is to select you, not to reject you. And their job is to select the best one suited for the job. The fourth is, the board members are very knowledgeable, experienced and much more smarter than you. They know why you are behaving in what manner and what and, and what is the pattern of your behavior. How is it that you are going to see your behavior? So they have seen many kids like you. I use the word kids because you are actually a kid in front of them. They have kids like you in the family and they know each and every of your move. Whatever that you are doing right now, they have already done it before and they have already pass through this type of phase. So, in order to create the first impression in an interview, the interviewers form their opinion. One must go to know that the interviewers form their opinion in the first few minutes. Rest of the time is used to reinforce this opinion. This happens because of the effect of the first impression. First impression or subsequent impression is the matter of perception of the interviewers about you. First impression is the chemistry that a candidate is able to forge with the board members eh, that you develop with the board members eh, when you have the first rendezvous with the board members. Eh. This perception is formed on the basis of the ensemble of your personality that you reflect at the moment you enter the interview room and eh, your eh, nature of interaction with the interviewers within the first few minutes. Eh. That's when they're going to form, a, form an opinion. It's not too difficult. I mean, if you any of these candidates happen to come to to the age of the interviewers, they will come to know it's not too difficult to make an assessment, eh? although sometimes this assessment may go on to go wrong. The interviewer will first to observe you from outside and subsequently probe you from inside whether whatever that you have said, whatever facade that you have presented has been correct or not. So what makes a very good impression of you? 
first is the way you enter into the room, whether you leave the door open, whether you leave the door closed there, whether you are nervous, I mean, you are bound to be nervous. But is it that uh, you try to f you try, try to fudge this nervousness, uh, or uh, is it that you try to fudge this uh, confidence in you as well? The walk, whether it is going to be shaking, whether it is going to be confident, whether it is going to be hesitant, uh, and uh, from door to the chair. The third is the appropriate body language. Etiquettes and manners uh, show a lot about the character. That is, they're going to show a lot about the character, upbringing, or the sanskar, or the values of that person. What the kindness needs to show is that these are traits of his part of personality or not. Or is it that that is part of a tact? If it is that the board happens to know that it's part of a tact, not a part of the character, then they do going to form a negative perception about you. The fourth is the attire, whether it is elegant and sober, and whether one is able to carry it. It's like in a blistering summer heat if one is uh, wearing a suit uh, then of course that doesn't go to sound very logical on that count uh. now we can imagine that 2017 that is this time's interview 2018's interview in winters and that is in january right uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, 13th of january today and uh, when the interview goes on to start maybe even from a uh, even from the end of uh, uh, january after 26 27th uh, then still it will be comfortable enough to wear a suit and that will go to look good also. How is it that the kind is going to posture themselves on the chair, whether it is going to be upright or it is going to be relaxed there, or whether it is going to be uh, very attentive. The eye contact of the interviewer who is asking this question and uh, whether one is able to maintain this part or not. Uh, how is it and why is it that you are going to hide this type of an eye contact is something that can be something that can be known and something that can be better known as well. And then the tone and tenor of the language, uh, whether the candidate goes on to show himself that he is very, very arrogant of sorts uh, or whether one is very judgmental, the interviewer is able to know it with the help of a tone and tenor of the language. So it's always going to be saying there is use sweet and soft language. Uh, the tone is not going to be too loud or so. And these are some of the things that do come with practice, but these are some of the things yeah, that are also ingrained as well. And lastly, how much is it that uh, you respect the views uh, of the different perspective and how is it that you're going to respond to this? So, taking all of these things into account, uh, what can be suggested? What can be the directions that can be given? The first is, never be arrogant in fault of the board. Of course, no one wants to be, but maybe you have developed a trait in due course of a time and you do not know whether it's a, a trait that you have developed or not and whether your language is arrogant or not. For example, you may go on to say that is a, can you please repeat it if you have not understood, a, uh, understood uh, a question. Or maybe that you can go on to say instead of yes, you say yeah, right. Now, this is something that is not going to be taken lightly by the board at all. In this case, not a lot, absolutely not lightly. If you have to talk about, uh, let's say, asking the board to repeat certain things, uh, you can go to make a request. Sir, I have not been uh, able to understand it. Uh, will you mind please repeating it? Now, that goes on to become much more soothing uh, rather than blatantly saying that, can you repeat it? Then the other component is that do not argue with the board in any matter with them. For example, we have known a kind of who, uh, who has talked about uh, the world's uh, most saline body. The most saline body happens to be in Antarctica. And at minus 40 degrees centigrade, this saline body of water does not go into freeze because of the very, very, very high salinity associated with it. Now the Boy ultimately asks, how can it be? Now, the board member is saying that it is. Don Juan Pond is uh, the one lake that is the most saline. But he said, how can it be? Now, that is argument. When you're going to argue with the board in such a manner, the board is never going to let you go so easily. Third parties, don't bluff them. Largely because you are nothing in front of them. They are your gods and you are going to be caught then your career is gone. All of your 25 years of an effort which you have made for the purpose of coming to this, 30 minutes of interview is gone. Do not sulk. 
even if it is that you're going to find that some of the board members are arrogant to you right now they don't have anything to lose but you have everything to lose in this case do not react always respond to the question that is respond means a reaction means a, the moment the board has finished this question when you're going to start giving this in a form of a shooting of such take a time pause a bit think of it that is going to be called as a response response is seen in a tone and tenor of your language the same way as a as a reaction is seen in the tone and tenor of the language then never be negative never be negative in front of them and of course don't develop an aversion even though you may go on to think that the board is constantly scolding you that's a possibility that they may go on to end up scolding you you must always going to show how serious you are going to be with respect to the interview process because if getting an opportunity to make them feel that you are a learner then you will have to show that whatever be the outcome of the interview you are going to be a learner the basic purpose of interview is to pick up a person who is going to be having a learner's tendency not a person who is going to be having a judgmental judgmental nature that is going to be the first part associated with it that is yeah, what we have talked about is yeah, how is it that you can go on to make your first step first impression frame your attitude right before you go on to create your first impression that's the first component that the candidate has to follow the second part is comprehension of the question the second part it will be suggested to the candidate is a, to understand the question comprehend the question in an interview one has to comprehend the question very well and that begins by being a very very good listener now this will serve a two fold objective firstly when you listen attentively you tend to understand questions correctly this understanding will help you to answer the questions second when you listen attentively it will impress the interviewers that you are taking genuine interest in the in whatever they are asking you about and that you are a learner and that they are not being insulted also of course you can't understand and can't think in dreams also of doing it so in the listening process your expression should be such that you are taking active interest in what the interview is saying your expression must be backed up by your body language that means something like uh, you go on to listen to a question and your eyes are open uh, in this case uh, you are attentive uh, your body language is going to be so and then uh, you think of answering this question uh, effectively the third part is communicate effectively an effective communication is one which sends the subject main matter of the communication in a way that the receiver of the message understands it and in the same way exactly in the same way as it is intended to by the sender if i say something and they understand something then there are two possibilities the first is that either the other person goes on to be taking everything on the basis of the perception in the past that means say they going to understand everything on the basis of whatever that they have known in the past second is that maybe by maybe i do not have so much amount of a command over language so as to convey to them that this is what actually i mean so that's one part besides sending the subject matter effective communication also invokes say, putting higher emphasis on more important matter Now, written communication this is done through underlining the more important matters say, or putting them into italic or in bold form in the case of oral communication this is done by changing tone style supported by the body language so it is tone tonality the emphasis on the words that we going to talk about i repeat emphasis on the words that we going to be talking about cannot going to make such type of gesture say so but that's what exactly matters in this case say. in order that you make your communication clear and communicate what is intended to be communicated you have to follow certain type of tips in this case one after interviewer has finished his question pause for a moment and organize your answer in a correct manner that's one this goes on to give you some amount of a time to think and then going to answer it second is you have a glass of water in your front at least in the guise of drinking a glass of water you can go on to take some amount of time to think of answering the question organize your answer use your words carefully that shows your attitude of becoming an administrator third is 
If the question is of technical nature, technical words may be used, but for answering a non-technical question, it is not necessary to use technical words. Fourth is, the questions have to be answered in a specific manner. And the fifth is, that is that you have to follow question, not allow your answer to be deviated away from the question. So, if the question is something, the answer has to be bang on that target. Not exactly that you're going to be deviating or think of deviating it. If it is that, you are asked about what is the relationship of increment capital output ratio with inflation. You don't have to talk about the causes of inflation. You have to talk about the relationship that exists here. If someone is going to be talking about uh, that Delhi's main cause of pollution uh, is uh, going to be it's a particulate material, then you don't have to blame entire of the blame only on this double burning. So, similarly, if you have been asked to define or enumerate the features of an object, just mention the various points because uh, someone has asked you to enumerate it. Enumerate this. So, you have to number it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Not exactly that, you have to elaborate it extensively. Now, we assume and understand that this type of a question should not be asked in the civil services largely because it's not meant for it. But still, you can uh, imagine that this is a type of a question that can be asked here. If you have been asked to discuss the feature, follow your answer accordingly and uh, if you are asked to analyze it, do it accordingly and do not enumerate it. In both of these cases, allow your answer to come to a logical conclusion. If the interviewers ask for detail of any point, explain that in detail. That is one point that has to be taken into, that to take into account. So, keep on elaborating it until you are disrupted, until you are asked to stop by the interviewer. Mind this part. If you have been asked to elaborate on something, you keep on, it's like a, that is you're going to become extempore, keep on speaking. A, not that you stop and then say, now what? You have to keep on speaking and allow a situation to come to a point where the interviewer actually disrupts you. That is, he goes on to obstruct you saying that, well, we have understood that part. The fourth is, you have to understand the question. If you have been asked a question which you could not comprehend properly, for any reason, it is better that you politely ask the interviewer to repeat his question once again for example example for this year example from this year's point of view one of these important topics is going to be quad that is the quadrilateral cooperation that india is forging with uh, australia india japan and with united states now the question can go on to be that is uh, what is the likely impact of quad on india you do not going to talk about what exactly is quad that is comprehension is going to be bad in this case yeah. Impact on India, you do not going to start talking about that uh, it has uh, been uh, because of uh, the Chinese threats uh, and that uh, it has been against China. This is not the way that you have to move ahead. Similarly, there may be possibility that the interviewer may ask a question whose comprehension and meaning is not as precise uh, that you can think of answering. In such, such case, you simply say, sir, this is the way that uh, I have understood your question. Am I right? Now that means uh, maybe that you are finding it difficult to comprehend the question and uh, you can go on to understand in such a manner. Now there has been a case uh, that means uh, last year itself uh, in one of these interviews the, uh, one of these students from physics uh, was asked a question on nuclear fusion. He was asked about cold fusion and he went on to elaborate everything on a uh, hot fusion and that too not in a proper manner. So he was ultimately reminded that you have been asked a question on a cold fusion that is a how to what extent it can go on to be effective because that was one of his first experiments that was done by Pons and so on from a United States University. Then he was talked about another one of them. He said there is a can you elaborate carbon cycle? The candidate straight away started saying that carbon cycle is the conversion of carbon uh, carbon in the soil of the world and that uh, it is the trees that is going to be responsible for carbon sequestering and things like that. The interviewer again interrupted that we were asking about the carbon cycle on the stars and he was taken aback completely. So because he was not able to comprehend the question and that's what, that where the problem was. Now just imagine uh, 
that is he he was one of these persons who had such a wonderful wonderful career in his front and he is appearing once again once again this year as well one one year has been lost so do not feel shy that the interviewer will going to feel bad on the contrary the interviewer will going to feel happy that your approach is precise and this will enhance your image it is always better that instead of giving wrong answer to a question ask for repetition and clarification but not every time this practice is not to be repeated frequently because it will definitely going to annoy the board the fifth part is discuss but do not argue at the outset you must understand the meaning of different words debate discussion conversation gossip and dialogue gossip is something that is a a conversation is meaningless conversation as as a more of entertainment value and that too in a negative manner you cannot going to do with the interviewer at all you cannot going to do a gossip with the interviewer unless uh, they specifically ask you to engage in a gossip debate generally ensures that you want to prove your point it is not but then even if it is that uh, you want to debate you cannot going to debate with your elders i repeat you cannot debate with your elders and when done without any basis any logic here it can be very 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 unpleasant now this type of debate is likely because uh, the candidate may going to feel that uh, he has a uh, to take a stand now this is a word that is a uh, that does going to make mark in uh, the corridors of rajinder nagar and mukherji nagar and uh, in chennai and bangalore most of these people going to say take a stand despite the fact that they don't going to know the meaning of taking a stand a stand means say uh, you have taken one stand uh, and you are not going to be deviating away even though you are wrong now this will actually this goes on to give a very 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 wrong picture largely because uh, sometimes when you going to take a not a stand uh, sometimes you go on to follow a perspective then the board goes on to feel that uh, this perspective may not be correct uh, and they board the board goes on to give you certain uh, certain uh, pointers uh, certain uh, symbols uh, and uh, certain messages by way of which you can going to change uh, your conclusion and if they going to think that you are going to be taking a stand and you are rigid on it then the board feels that you are rigid you cannot be trained and that you should be out of these services discussion is generally done, done to know something is strengthen any conclusion or to come to any conclusion or to solve any problem in a definite direction it is by and large very constructive so you can go to discuss certain things uh, maybe with yourself with any of these board members as well to come to a to a conclusion conversation is a means of communication to express yourself in a manner that you going to feel it like so of course you are not going to be converse you are not going to be entering into a conversation with the board members at all you can only go to enter into a dialogue with them we'll come on to that part what it means eh? but there are certain things that you should never go on to do for example gossip is something eh, that eh, generally helps you to imbibe certain type of linguistic skills eh, that the candidates are unaware of eh, and eh, that is very undignified language it's like eh, yeah we did it eh, it's like awesome it looked awesome now that is a language of gossip you cannot go on to club everything that it was an awesome project it is a, an awesome policy of the government of india this is a language not of a not of a discussion that is you can go to say it's a correct policy and it is a policy that requires reconstruction and so on so forth there will be specifically chosen words for that gossip language devoid of dignity and candidates are unaware of the fact that gossip leads to an undignified language and that's why that's what they do in practice eh, during the course of their preparation but as you said said dialogue is more about the dialogue is the best form of communication it is more about equality of conversation where the two parties share conversation at equal level and at equal status eh, it is aimed at knowing the stance of each other if the board involves in a dialogue that means uh, the board is treating you at the same level that means uh, you can be pretty sure of the fact that you are through with it because when the board goes on to think that you're capable of a standing a dialogue it is only then they're going to 
involve you in a dialogue. They do not going to involve you in a dialogue. Everyone, not every Tom, Dick and Harry is going to be involved in a dialogue in this case. <clears throat> it is suggested that then they do treat the interview as a discussion forum and not an argument forum at all. Never ever argue. You are no one to argue. You are no one in front of them to argue at all. And to prove your point because you have taken a stand. At any place, any point of time someone has asked you to take a stand, think of it. Flexibility is what is required in your case that you can go to change your stance depending on maybe input of a new variable in you. So when you're going to get a new variable which never knew, is it not that you're going to change your uh, stance towards it? There are certain things, uh, let's say I have already reached a conclusion and I got to know something new and so new that it goes on to change my entire perception towards it. That's flexibility. Flexibility, the hallmark of a student and a learner. Discussion involves deliberating on issues that may emerge from a question in order to sort out the issues. It is possible that, uh, that uh, it may be a question over question, particularly on an in-depth interview. So the board keeps on asking questions, you keep on evolving questions uh, and it, it, it can go to happen. For example, again, uh, uh, in 2014, one of these candidates uh, was asked a question on climatic change uh, and the whole of it was on climatic change because one of these board members felt that uh, Climatic change is not a reality, it is a hoax, right? So, the candidate kept on saying that no, it's not a hoax. Now, the fact is that eh, half of the world goes on to know that climate is changing. Half of the world goes on to say climate is not changing. Now, even now, you have a President eh, Trump eh, who is saying that climate is not changing. So, you have to believe in that. Now, any type of change in perspective that has to be gently then that has to be gently uh, conveyed to it. You have a right to differ, but only when you have a perspective built on variables that are very well known and very, very, very solid. If you don't have a solid, uh, solid variable on which you can go to build a perspective, it's really, really, really very difficult. So, how is it that you can go to, let's say, if you have to differ from the board, how is it that you can go to differ? There are general ways, there are very specific ways. You do not, you can, normal condition is that the general uh, candidate is going to say, sir, I beg to differ from you. Now, there are better ways of saying it. So, you can always go to say, that is, uh, sir, we cannot go on to doubt uh, your, uh, sir or ma'am, any of you, cannot go on to doubt your conclusion. Uh, but based on the variables that I have, uh, I, it seems that the conclusion is going to be completely different for me. Of course, they have a different set of variables, you have a different set of variables. So you have to say that you are correct. But maybe that my set of variables are different. That's why I am able to reach a conclusion that is going to be different. If the interviewer does not agree with your view and still persists on the earlier stand, it is best to retreat rather than take a again take a stand and prove that the interviewer is wrong. Whom are you going to prove wrong? I mean, to those people who are uh, going to be your judge on that day, your gods on that day. I just want to give you one more example on that count. The year Sachin Tendulkar retired from cricket and of course thereafter, there was a question that was uh, asked on a, a comparison between Sachin Tendulkar and Sunil Gavaskar. The question was, whom do you think that is the best batsman? The answer part came the reply, sir, I like Sachin Tendulkar very much. He is the best batsman in the world. And the board asked how his stance is very good, he plays very well, he hits the ball very hard. Now that cannot go on to be a question. Now then the board started giving their candidates a feedback, it started giving the candidates feedback. The feedback that was given was, when Gavasco was playing cricket, the pitches were uncovered. That meant eh, next day the ball was doing all sorts of things, number one. Second was, Gavasco was facing the type of fast bowlers that the world has never ever known. The best breed of fast bowlers the world has ever seen and ever produced. Tendulkar hasn't seen any of those type of categories of fast bowlers. The third. Gavaskar used to be playing without any helmet. Tendulkar goes into with all the type of protection possible. The fourth. Gavaskar was an opener. 
So he was said to see that the ball is new and that the ball goes on to swing like that over boomerang. Tendulkar never faced it. Tendulkar was always supported by two of these batsmen, Sidhu, who went to demolize the, the ballers, Sidhu, and then it was a it was Dravid who went on to wear the ballers out. It was only then that Sanchin Tendulkar used to be coming. That was not with Gavaskar. The fifth was that Sachin Tendulkar has a lot of batsmen in his era to support himself. Well. That was, of course, the fabulous 5 4 that you may have come to know Sachin Tendulkar, Vivius Lakshman, Saurav Ganguly, Rahul Dravid, all of them. Gavaskar had only two players, and in his era, it was Gavaskar and Gundapa Vishwanath. So the pressure to perform was very, very, very high. Seventh was after. 50 tests, Gavaskar had 20 test centuries. Sachin Tendulkar never had so much. Still, despite giving so many examples that Gavaskar is a much, much, much better batsman, they still persisted, he still persisted with Sachin Tendulkar. Needlessly, he was nowhere in the list, all in all. Now, in a similar manner, you can go on to be asked a question, is it that Virat Kohli is going to be as good a batsman as that of Sachin Tendulkar? Now, I don't know what will be a response, but uh, Virat Kohli again is not going to be facing those type of ballers that Sachin Tendulkar has faced, which are the only opponents uh, that you're going to be having right now. Which are them? You have England right now. You have not played Pakistan for a good amount of time. Sri Lanka is gone. New Zealand is completely gone. So it's England, South Africa and uh, Australia to an extent. West Indies are no more a force. Sri Lanka is no more a force. Eh? And uh, New Zealand are no more a force. Eh? Now imagine, eh, and of course not to talk about Bangladesh and Zimbabwe in this case. Eh, if you go to making runs against this type of opponent, you are obviously not going to be comparing yourself with uh, Sachin Tendulkar. Theme is that if you take a so-called stand and that you can't go to prove that lead to an argument and counter argument eh, and eh, that is going to definitely go against you. Whenever you have to give your opinion, always ask the interview board or a permission for a permission because you can go because you don't go to give an opinion in front of your elders without their permission. You always say, sir, can I have a permission to voice my opinion in this case? Ask their permission. And only when they have given a permission, only then give it. Otherwise, it's ill mannerism to give your opinion in front of someone very senior and one who knows much more than you on the subject. And there can be different type of modus operandi for expressing your opinion. As I talked about, that is a, that is a one of these ways is that, a, sir, I have a different set of variables on which I have formed my opinion. A. Can I be voiced to express it? It's going to be different from you because I don't know what variables you have based your opinion from, and it's different from that. That's one of the best ways in which you can go to go. Because then the interviewer knows that you have, you are very, very suave, very sophisticated and you have a learner's attitude with you. Six is be humble, admit shortcomings. Always, re always remember the interviewers have been chosen by the UPC as a, they are an authority. An authority on the subject, an authority over the issue and have an experience in public domain that is far, far, far ahead of you. More importantly, they are in a position to determine your future and their job is to choose the best candidate suited for the services. Apart from anything else, the interview must be in a learning experience for you despite the fact that it goes on to, it doesn't go on to end in any success for you. You must remember that if you are judgmental, then the career is over for you. In this case, if in answering any question, you make a mistake and the interviewer points it out, accept your mistake. Don't argue. A mistake is a wrong judgment of the situation and acting on that is always going to be good. Therefore, committing a mistake is not very unusual phenomena while persisting on that mistake after it has been discovered, it is a blunder. It's a simple blunder. Therefore, if you, if you can commit any mistake, eh, then during the interview process, admit it and offer an apology. But you don't have to offer an apology by saying that, sir, I apologize for that. Of course, that is one of the ways, but there can be better ways also. That is, eh, 
you can always going to say sir these were some of these things that were not known to me i have gone on to become a much more wiser person after uh, having discovered that uh, i was not correct so the best response under such a situation circumstance will be to let the board know that uh, you have learned from the mistake and thank the board to have made you learn something you can always going to say sir thank you so much for that i have been enlightened uh, and my concepts are revised uh, and i'll go to modify it allowing yourself to be corrected helps you in many ways for example it shows that you are amenable to mentoring that means you can be mentored that means you can be reformed you can be taught and that the second is that that you are a learner and that of course you are wise that's the third one is that you are wise now then there are of course you can understand certain things logically and you have certain set of variables on the basis of which you can go on to make a conclusion but the number of variables uh, that you have uh, may not be as much as the number of variables that the person goes on to be having it uh. let's say if i happen to be an expert on a uh, central asia and someone goes on to ask me about a uh, ask me what nagorno karabakh uh, conflict uh, then i may be in a better position to talk about armenia and azerbaijan and chechen republic issues in comparison to anyone else how is it that anyone can go to argue who has just a general knowledge on that topic moreover you must always remember that no one likes an arrogant person everyone likes a person with humility do not bring your ego which is indicative of your immature mentality you may not know that you are arrogant but sometimes your body language will going to show that and in that case the board will annoy you even more say that means it can going to annoy you even more so in some of these cases the best thing will be that is accept your mistake and if you don't going to know the answer say no no means not directly not blatantly there are there are at least 10 ways that by way of which you can go to say no take an example one of these ways in which you can go to say so if that is correct so i am not able to recall the answer correctly if uh, you allow me some type of an error of judgment i may try this answer that's one way second is sir i know only two or three variables uh, and on the basis of which if i go on to make a conclusion that may be wrong if you permit me i may try the third is there is a i know that what this answer will be but i know, do not know in its complete entity i may be sounding factual if i go on to give an answer which is requiring an analytical explanation can i be permitted the fifth way the fourth can be there is a i do not know this answer but if you permit me i may try to frame an answer on the basis of a certain things that i have learned from this board that can be fifth one there can be 10 ways by way of which you can go to say no not exactly that you have to say blatantly say no i don't know this answer or sorry sir i don't know this answer and then going to keep quiet you don't have to make such type of abrupt statements in that case seventh is be so of and polite it pays to remain polite throughout the interview process even if any unpleasant situation is created by interviewer and this will be done deliberately to test your patience uh, test uh, your uh, state of mind and frame of mind this is something that can be done if you show anger and express displeasure to uh, to protect your ego you may be treated as a vacillating person devoid of objectivity these personality traits are not considered suitable for any job being polite in the interview conveys that you have respect for the other's perspective you are open minded to accept new ideas and change yourself accordingly as per the demands of a given situation remember the most important sign of an intellectual mind is uh, to engage an idea without actually agreeing to it i repeat it the most important sign of an intellectual mind is uh, to engage an idea without agreeing to it you have to be intellectual it is display proper etiquette and manners interview is a formal process though sometimes uh, the process may be conducted by the interview in such a manner that it appears to be in formal process uh, this is sometimes done deliberately to put a candidate at an ease and encourage him or her to force 
reveals some traits about him. It's like that the boat comes to know that uh, if the candidate is angered, then it will, it will be the real metal of it that will going to come out. Uh, that is, uh, they may try to scratch the facade that you may have created or they may have felt that you have created such type of facade. If, it's such a, if such a situation arises before you, then do not forget to display the etiquette in the manner of a formal interview process. Etiquettes and mannerisms are a sign of your upbringing, sanskar, values, as well as your civilization. Also, when you respect someone, it shows that you are strong. Respecting someone is the first sign of being stronger. It may also happen that uh, during an interview, some refreshment is brought to, to the interviewers. Generally, on such an occasion, refreshment is also served to the candidate sitting in the interview room as part of his etiquette. If that is not served, no issues at all. But if a <clears throat> such a situation comes before you and the interview asks to interviewer asks to take you some refreshment, eh, like tea, then do not deny this offer because that is going to be against the etiquette. Eh. This is largely because they are offering you. You may go on to say, sir, that is a, that will go on to help me concentrate eh, on the interview. Uh, I'll go on to take a sip eh, if you don't mind. And eh, of course, it's going to be always a privilege to be taking tea with you. I'll go on to relish this moment forever. If you do not take any particular item of refreshment server, many persons do not take tea or coffee, for example, then um, you do not have to say no. Why to say no? If a tea or coffee can go on to give you 5 to 10 extra marks, isn't it worth? It is. Ninth is, end it on a very pleasant, sober and lasting note. It is in the last stage that the chairman of the board strengthens his marking uh, on, your, on your answer sheet. So do not do anything eh, terrible that the chairperson changes his mind and retreats eh, from giving you the desired marks he may have thought of you. If eh, you have been able to carve a niche for yourself eh, in the interview so far, so far, so you have not done and you have not done anything terrible, then do not do anything that goes on to become so. And there are several things that you can go on to do. First is, submit yourself to the board as if you are a learner and will always remain to be so. This is the best thing. The board does not like people being arrogant. Being confident is different, being arrogant is different. Second is, make them feel that you are a very good learner and you are a very good, you could have been a very good son or daughter. Everyone likes a good son or a daughter. Third is, End it on a light note, with a smile even if you feel defeated. You are likely to. It's possible that you go going to sing that you are completely blue of your interview. That means it has been terrible. It has been devastating. Now, still if you can go on to be comfortable, calm, you do not know what can go on to transpire with the board and the board can go on to feel that despite that, eh, despite taking a heavy battering, eh, you have not let your patience go out. That may go on to go for you. Other is that if you think that you have spoiled your interview, you can go to make them realize that you have realized it as well, and there's no harm in it. Eh, that eh, and that also you don't have to do anything to lose. In any case, eh, it's going to be a lose position that way. Lastly, do not make the board feel that you are boisterous about your interview, and that has been very good. Maybe that eh, you can the board will go on to say, see your interview has been very good, and you say, yes, sir, I knew that, eh. right? Eh? Not exactly this way. You don't have to be boisterous in this case. Let them feel that they are gods and that you are not novice and not someone who is always and, and always and as someone who is always, always, always willing to learn. Only those people are chosen to the services who are willing to learn. Only those people. Only those people are chosen who are who are having the ability to learn. Remember. There is a thin line that separates confidence from arrogance and intelligence from cleverness. You can be intelligent, but you can't be cunning.